Hello, and welcome to this video for Physics 131 on the idea of center of gravity and center of mass. Now, there is a slight technical distinction between these two ideas. However, for this particular course, we're going to treat these two terms as synonymous. So what is a center of mass? Center of mass is an idea with multiple facets that are all related. The center of mass is the weight mass-weighted average location of an object. Furthermore, the center of mass is the point at which gravity acts. When we get into our discussion of torque, we're going to be interested in the location at which each force is applied, which means we're going to need to figure out where the force of gravity acts. The force of gravity acts at the center of mass. So the first part of the definition of center of mass is a mass-weighted average location of an object. Now, this is a lot going on. So let's think about what a weighted average is first, in a context with which you are probably more familiar with the idea. Think about your grades. Not each assignment in a given course counts the same. For example, in this class, the weights for the different assignments are provided in the black table on the left. Now, if you got the grades in the blue table on the right, what would your final grade be in this particular course? To calculate a weighted average, what you do is you take the value, in this case for a category, and you multiply it by a weight. And the weight is the worth out of the total. And you add up all these different contributions. And we know the symbol for adding up a bunch of stuff is this Greek letter symbol. Let's work this through for this particular example. So in this particular example, this hypothetical student achieved a 95, so that would be the value, on the online homework. And the online homework is worth 10 out of a total of 100. So I've done the value of 95. It's worth 10 out of a total of 100. And now I just repeat this for all the different categories. This hypothetical student achieved a 75 on the IRATs, which are worth 9 out of 100. On exam 1, our student achieved a 70, and exam 1 is worth 14 out of the total 100 for the course. Our hypothetical student did the same on the other two exams, so I'm going to repeat this two more times. And now we move on to the team side. On the team side, our student achieved a 90 on the in-class activities. So we add 90 to our in-class activities, which are worth 18 of the total 100. On the T-RATS, our hypothetical student achieved a 95. T-RATS are also worth 9 out of 100. And on the first team exam, our hypothetical student achieved an 85, and team exam 1 is worth 4 of the 100. And similarly for the other two team exams. Now, if you compute this calculation, you get an 81.05, which if you go and look at the syllabus, is a B plus. This is a weighted average of scores for the course. Center of mass is similarly a weighted average only we're using mass to weight our average, and we're averaging position. 
So let's look at this particular example of a 5 kilogram object and a 2 kilogram object. And let's calculate the center of mass for these two objects. The first step is to establish a coordinate system. When we're talking about positions, I need a coordinate system. So I am going to establish the positive x direction to be that way. Now I can go and calculate the mass weighted average. I start with the 5 kilogram object. So the x location of the center of mass, I take my value, which is 0 meters, because I'm interested in finding the average position. And then I multiply it by the weight, which in this case is 5 kilograms divided by my total, which is 5 kilograms plus 2 kilograms. I then move on to my 2 kilogram object. My value is 2 meters because that's the location of the object. And then my weight is 2 kilograms divided by the total, which is again 5 kilograms plus 2 kilograms. Because of this zero, this whole quantity goes to zero, it's multiplication, leaving me with a center of mass of 2 meters multiplied by 2 kilograms over 7 kilograms. You can see that the unit kilogram will cancel, leaving me with 2 meters times 2 over 7, now unitless, being equal to the center of mass, leaving me with a center of mass of 4 over 7 meters. Again, the center of mass is an average position weighted by mass, and so my units should be a unit of position, meters, which is what I get. If I plug this into a calculator, we can see that I get a numerical value of 0 0.57 meters, which means that the center of mass is somewhere here-ish, much closer to the 5 kilogram object than to the 2 kilogram object. So that's the center of mass in one dimension. What happens if we have masses in more than one dimension? Say, two. Well, the way we handle this is, as usual, we separate the directions. We deal with x, and we deal with y, and we deal with them separately. So let's think about this example of a sulfur dioxide molecule. The sulfur dioxide molecule consists of two oxygen atoms and one sulfur. And in the problem, we see that a sulfur atom is twice as massive as an oxygen atom. Now, we don't have any masses given in the problem, but that's okay. We'll apply our usual trick and say the oxygen has mass m, we'll assign a, val a variable to it, and our sulfur atom will therefore have mass 2m. And to solve the problem, we will separate the directions. So we'll deal with the directions one at a time, say deal with x first. Now the value we need is the x location of the oxygen atom on the left. And we would multiply it by the mass of the oxygen atom over the total mass. And then we will repeat this for the second oxygen and for the sulfur. But before we go and do that, let's clean this up a little bit. Now the total mass is going to be m, m, 2m, so a total of 4m. Now we need the x location of this particular oxygen atom. We know that this distance is 0 0.143 nanometers, and that this angle is 60 degrees. We want how far is it in 
x, or this distance here. For this, we can use trigonometry. So this distance is our x, o, l, as I've been calling it. So if we look at our triangle, the sine of 60 degrees is going to be this XOL divided by 0 0.143 nanometers, which means that XOL is going to be 0 0.143 nanometers sine of 60 degrees which when I plug that into a calculator, I get 0 0.124 nanometers. Is this the value we want, however? No. If we go and look at our picture again, we see that the position of this oxygen atom on the left is in fact negative. My calculator will never give me that. I have to just look at my picture and know to put the negative sign in my calculation. So now returning to my center of mass calculation, we've got that the X center of mass, the value we've now calculated it as negative one, two, four nanometers. And the weight, is going to be the mass of the oxygen atom, which we call m, divided by 4m, and we see that the m's cancel. We then move on to repeat this process with, say, the sulfur atom. For the sulfur atom, the value, the location of the atom, is at x equals 0 nanometers because it's at the origin. The weight is 2m over the total 4m. And again, we see that the masses m cancel. Finally, we would move on to our oxygen atom on the right. If this distance is 0.124, then this distance going to be 0.124. So we're going to be left with 0.124 nanometers. And again, the weight is going to be the mass of the oxygen atom m over the total mass 4m. And we see that the m's again cancel. Now, the middle quantity is nicely zero because of this zero here, which leaves us with an x center of mass of minus 0 0.124 nanometers over 4 plus 0 0.124 nanometers over 4, which I don't even need to put that into a calculator. I can see that that adds to 0, which means that the center of mass in the x direction of our molecule is at x equals 0. Or we know that the center of mass of this molecule lies along this line. We don't know where along this line yet because we haven't calculated y. We've only looked at x. But we know it's going to be somewhere along the line x equals 0. Now a useful shortcut for solving these problems is to look for the symmetries. We could have actually probably seen this without actually doing the calculation because we can see that there is a mass some distance to the right of x equals 0, and the same mass to the left of x equals 0. So the average of these two is going to be x equals 0. This looking for shortcuts in the symmetry of the problem is a nice way to speed up these calculations. So now we've calculated the x position of the center of mass of this object. What about the y? So, as usual, we're separating our directions. So now we're only looking at the y. So if we look at the y center of mass, we'll again start with this oxygen on the left. So the center of mass in y will be 
the value for the oxygen on the left multiplied by the weight, where the weight is again based upon the mass, so in this case m over the total mass 4m, and these m's cancel. And then we will repeat the calculation for the other two atoms. As before, let's sort of clean this up before we get all into the other atoms. So now we're looking for this distance here. And I go and I draw my triangle again. And we see that YOL, as I've called it, can be determined from cosine of 60 degrees is going to be YOL adjacent over the hypotenuse, 0 0.143 nanometers. Which means YOL is going to be 0 0.143 nanometers cosine of 60 degrees, which when I plug that into my calculator gives me a Y position of the oxygen on the left of being 0 0.0 0.072 nanometers. So my center of mass calculation for this oxygen on the left that I've circled in black is going to be 0 0.072 nanometers multiplied by the weight of 1 over 4. Then I will move on to my sulfur atom. The sulfur atom has a y position of 0 because it's located at the origin and a weight of 2m over 4m. So again, the m's cancel. Finally, we move on to this oxygen on the right that I've circled in red. We can see that the y position of this oxygen is going to be the same as the other one, so 0 0.072 nanometers and the weight is going to be m over 4m. And again, the m's cancel. Similar to before, but not always true, we have a zero here, so this whole term goes to zero. Leaving us with a y center of mass of 0 0.072 nanometers over 4 plus 0 0.072 nanometers over 4, over 4. In this case, both are positive, and so they add as opposed to cancel like last time, and we are left with a vertical position of 0 0.036 nanometers, which if we come up here and try to draw on our picture, we know that this is 0 0.072, 0 0.036 is roughly half of that. So our center of mass is going to be somewhere along this Y line. And the spot where the two cross is where our center of mass is going to be. So our full center of mass, we could write as a coordinate pair, X, C, M, Y, CM of 0, 0 0.036 meters. And that will be the center of mass of this sulfur dioxide molecule. So that's how we calculate the center of mass for objects that are a collection of point particles. But what about objects that aren't collections of point particles? Well, as long as the object is uniform, and this is a very important caveat, then the center of mass will be at the geometric center of the object. So what do I mean by that? I mean that if we have, say, a meter stick, then the center of mass will be at the 50 centimeter mark. As that's the middle of the meter stick. If I have a metal washer, then the center of mass will be at the geometric center, right in the middle. You can notice that the center of mass does not need to be inside the body of the object. It can in fact be some random point in space. The center of mass of the washer is not within the metal, it's within the center of the hole. But what about objects that are not uniform? 
Well, the answer in this case is divide the object up into uniform chunks. Find the center of mass of each chunk. Treat each chunk as a point particle located at the center of mass. And then calculate as usual. So here I have a nice example problem of a slab made of a light half and a heavy half. And let's think about trying to find the center of mass of this particular object. Thinking ahead, I expect it to be on this side of the middle because this is the heavier side of the object. Furthermore, I can already say from the symmetry of the problem that the center of mass is going to lie along this line right in the middle vertically of the object. So I'm going to establish this as my coordinate system, x and y. And from the symmetry of the problem, I can say that the y value of the center of mass is going to be 0. Now I can find the center of mass of each chunk, treat each chunk as a point particle, and calculate as usual. Now each chunk is uniform. So the center of mass of the yellow chunk on the left is going to be right in the middle, which is right where I put my origin, because I was kind of thinking ahead. The center of mass of the right chunk is also going to be in the middle. The value of x for this chunk is going to be, well, that's going to be 1 meter. That's going to be 1 meter. So this is going to have x equals 2 meters. So I've found the center of mass of each slab based upon the fact that they're uniform. And now I'm going to calculate the center of mass, treating these objects as point particles located at their own center of mass. So I have for the slab on the left, we're only caring about x because we've already solved for y. So for the object on the left, we have uh, the value is 0, and the weight is 2 kilograms over 2 kilograms plus 8 kilograms. For the slab on the right, where I'll move to green because the yellow is kind of hard to see on the white background, we have a value of 2 meters and a weight of 8 kilograms over 2 kilograms plus 8 kilograms. Again, we have a 0, which gives us a center of mass in x of 2 meters over 8 kilograms over 10 kilograms. The units of kilograms cancel as they should. So that gives us a center of mass of 16 meters over 10, or 1.6 meters. Which means that the center of mass on our picture is somewhere up past the midpoint where the two slabs join, but not all the way to the center of mass of the 8 kilogram slab. So our center of mass is going to be somewhere like there. As we expected, it will be to the right of the midpoint. So that's one part of the definition for center of mass, the mass weighted average position of the object. The center of mass is also the location where gravity can be said to act. As I said at the beginning of this video, when we discuss torque, we'll be interested in where each force acts. For example, when I open a door, I tend to apply the force at the knob of the door. Gravity acts at the center of mass. So if we look at this chicken, and we were to make a free body diagram, we would say there are two normal forces, one for each foot, and the weight force. But now we're going to start thinking about where each force is being applied. The two normal forces are being applied, one on each foot, so they're being applied there. And the weight force is applied at the center of mass, or the center of gravity. Remember that these are synonymous terms as far as this class is concerned, which is roughly in the middle of the chicken. So the normal forces get applied where the feet meet the ground, 
and the weight force gets applied at the center of gravity, or the center of mass. So this is the second part of the definition of center of mass. The center of mass is the point where gravity can be said to act. This part of the definition of center of mass has some consequences. The first piece is that if an object is suspended from a point, then the center of mass will be below the point from which it is hung. So let's say we have some oddly shaped object, and I suspend it from a point like here. And I draw a nice line hanging straight down. The center of mass is somewhere on that line. Now if I take this same object and hang it from a different point, I know that the center of mass is somewhere on this line. Where the two lines cross will be the center of mass. This technique is actually useful for finding the center of mass of irregular objects. Another consequence of the definition of center of mass as being the point where gravity is said to act means that the center of mass is what follows the parabolic path that we know and love for objects in projectile motion. So this hammer follows a rather complicated path, but the center of mass, which is closer to the head of the hammer, follows a nice parabolic path just like a ball would. A final consequence of the center of mass being the point at which gravity is said to act deals with the balance of an object. Now, if you hold an object under its center of mass, it will balance. So for the hammer in the previous example, if I put my finger close to the head of the hammer, I can balance the hammer at that point. However, more complicated objects were usually interested in not balancing on a single point. So we needed to find a quantity known as base of support. And the base of support is the region where the object contacts the ground plus the space in between. So for the example of our chicken, the base of support is this area between the feet of the chicken. Or if you were to look at a person in some rather fancy shoes, the base of support is everywhere the foot contacts the ground so this line here, connected by a line, plus all of the region in between. All of this is the base of support. As long as the center of mass of an object is above the base of support, then an object will balance. We will explore this in a laboratory activity in class in more detail and become more comfortable with this idea. Right now, what I want you to take away from it is the definition of base of support, and the fact that the center of mass sort of has an aspect of its definition, which is that if the center of mass is over the base of support, then an object will balance, i.e. this bullet point here. So let's summarize this video, as there was a lot going on here. The center of mass and the center of gravity are, as far as this course is concerned, the same idea. So we might alternate between these two different terms. But as far as we're concerned, they're the same. And the definition of center of mass has many different aspects. The first aspect is that the center of mass is the mass weighted average position of an object. And that this, ob this point does not need to be inside the object itself, as we saw in the example of the washer. Second aspect of the center of mass is the center of mass is the point at which the force of gravity can be thought to act. And this aspect of the center of mass's definition has a couple of important consequences. The first is that if an object is suspended, then the center of mass will be below this suspension point on a straight line. We can also say that the center of mass is what follows the parabolic path in projectile motion. A perhaps more subtle consequence of this aspect of the center of mass's definition as being the point at which gravity can be thought to act is that an object will balance if its center of mass is over its base of support, which again, base of support is defined as all of the points where an object meets the ground, connected by straight lines, and all of the area inside. 